All right. Um, so, so again, you know, thank you so much for for having us here and inviting us to speak. Um, it's a it's a real pleasure, um, and and it was also um, a nice opportunity for us to you know in in in, in looking into uh, formulating you know more clearly how how we manage tracheal and subglottic pathologies to also learn more in the process about about ENT approaches, um, which I which I think you know both Kevin and I got exposure to in our training, but um, there's still a whole lot that we that we don't know about and that we we're eager to learn more about um, as we go forward with our with our careers in interventional pulmonary. Um, so uh, we have no conflicts of interest or relative disclosures. Um, our objectives are to characterize obstructive lesions of the trachea and subglottis, to become familiar with techniques used by interventional pulmonologists in the management of benign central airway conditions, uh, and to identify tracheal and subglottic lesions that may be best suited for bronchoscopic intervention. Um, we'll start off with a brief overview of interventional pulmonology, what it is we do in our, in our practice. Uh, we'll review very briefly some tracheal and subglottic anatomy. We'll go into a, a sort of a general assessment approach to benign central airway stenosis. And then we'll, we'll drill down on some specific benign tracheal and subglottic pathologies and go through how uh, interventional pulmonologists tend to approach these issues. Um, so I, I put these pictures in here because one of my, uh, one of my mentors in IP training would refer to himself to his patients as a lung plumber, um, which was sort of fun the first hundred times, and then and then the shine came off the apple a little bit. And and I think over time I've I've become to appreciate it again, realizing that um, for a lot of central airway disease, I don't think it's it's super far off from the truth. And and I hope that uh, we can stress some of the finer points of 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 what we do. But um, I, I think that there's sort of a, an apt comparison to be made. Um, a brief overview of IP. So, so in addition to some of the therapeutics we'll be talking about today, interventional pulmonary really encompasses three uh, main uh, main groups. One is advanced diagnostic bronchoscopy, therapeutic bronchoscopy, which will be the focus for today, and pleural diseases. Um, advanced diagnostics has has really come a long way in the history of bronchoscopy, from sort of very rudimentary fluoroscopy guided biopsies, which were um, uh, very imprecise all the way to using endobronchial ultrasound, electromagnetic navigation, um, and now uh, augmented fluoroscopy and cone beam CT to try to access uh, smaller and more peripheral lesions. And, and this is an example of a few different, uh, different approaches, different pieces uh, put together to reach this nodule on the left upper lobe. Um, in this, the picture in the middle, we have a bronchoscope, we have a, uh, an extended channel going out to the lesion, uh, an electromagnetic navigation catheter to try to map your way to the nodule. And then at the very end, a radial ultrasound probe showing that we were within the nodule and, and this turned out to be adenocarcinoma. Uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy um, is, is predominantly, I would say, oriented toward the treatment of malignant diseases, um, although today we'll be focusing on benign conditions. Uh, this picture is from a, a case that Kevin did here of a, a gentleman with metastatic squamous cell cancer who had a, um, a fistulous lesion in his distal left main stem, um, and, and it wasn't really suitable to, to putting a stent over. And so uh, Kevin improvised and uh, used an Amplatzer device for uh, atrial septal defect closure um, and inserted this bronchoscopically through the fistula, deployed it in place so that it sort of sandwiched either side of the opening. Um, and, and, and this was successful in, in, in abating the leak. This is a case that I, I, I saw during fellowship of a, a woman who had a mitral valve replacement and had a, a double lumen tube intubation that was, um, I think from the video, uh, you would agree was a little traumatic. Um, the large uh, posterior uh, tracheal rupture. Um, and this was managed with placement of a, of a covered uh, silicone stent. Um, and after about six weeks, the stent came out and the defect had, had healed up uh, quite nicely. Um, and then lastly, pleural disease. Uh, on the left is a cartoon of pleuroscopy. So this is using a semi-flexible uh, camera to go into the pleural space, get biopsies, uh, do deloculations, place chest tubes, et cetera. Um, and on the right is probably one of our most common pleural procedures. This is a tunnel pleural catheter for the management of recurrent malignant pleural effusion. Um, and then I, I put these, uh, these three, uh, three uh, individuals in here because although there are a lot of, of, of uh, pulmonologist role models in IP, um, a lot of the progenitors of our field are ENT surgeons. So on the left is Gustav Killian, um, I think doing a rigid esophagoscopy in this picture, but he sort of pioneered or, 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 or paved the way for bronchoscopy by when he removes a pork bone from the uh, right main stem bronchus in, in, a, in a farmer in, in 1876. Chevalier Jackson in the middle was, was um, an American physician, an ENT surgeon who uh, basically refined uh, rigid bronchoscopy, developed new tools for rigid bronchoscopy. And, and here he is in his, um, 
cool and slightly creepy library of things he extracted from people's airways over his, his long and storied career. Um, and on the right is William Montgomery, who, who uh, developed the Montgomery T-tube and, and, and was a pioneer in, in adapting silicone prostheses for use in the airway. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of our roots in IP uh, actually really come from the ENT world. So moving on to subglottic and tracheal anatomy and then, and then uh, subglottic and tracheal pathology, I think probably as everyone in, in, in this Zoom call knows, the trachea is a hollow tube bound on the front by cartilage that extends from the uh, inferior aspect of the larynx to the main carina. It's about 10 to 12 centimeters long, up to two and a half millimeter, a centimeter is wide, uh, 25 millimeters wide. Um, and uh, the, the portion that is the subglottis basically lies from the inferior aspect of the vocal cords to the inferior border of the cricoid ring. Um, blood supply for the cervical trachea comes from the inferior thyroid artery and the bronchial artery supply the uh, intrathoracic trachea. And innervation is mainly off cranial nerve 10 with sympathetic innervation from the middle cervical ganglion. Um, and when we're, when we're working in the airway, we tend not to think about the blood supply and innervation to the trachea itself, but, but more often of, of all of the important structures that are around it. Um, for example, the esophagus lying posterior, the anominate artery as it crosses around the level of the eighth ring, the carotids, further down the aortic arch. Um, and when we're, especially when we're doing uh, lung cancer staging and uh, lymph node biopsies, we come in very close proximity to vascular structures like the azygous vein, the SVC, and the pulmonary artery. Um, and so we're always very mindful of these structures when we're doing any interventions in the airway, uh, lest we get ourselves into big trouble. Uh, so we'll move on to talking about subglottic and tracheal stenosis. And, and, and these really comprise a very etiologically diverse array of conditions um, that have often frustratingly similar presentations that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and and, and as, as we'll see, there are, there are a lot of variations in management, um, both by etiology and characteristics of lesions but also between specialties and even between individual providers. Um, and this was something that's sort of always interesting to me um, being in a practice with IP docs who trained in different places is to see um, how our approaches are similar and, and how they differ. And, and then you know, learning from, from my colleagues about um, their different approaches to similar problems. Um, so one very common way of dividing up these pathologies is by etiology. Um, and you can look at them in terms of whether they're idiopathic, if they're innate or acquired, um, are they congenital, post-infectious, autoimmune, but a really sort of uh, quick and easy way of, of dividing things up is whether they're malignant or non-malignant. Um, and, and, and I find this to be a sort of a helpful class of way to classify things because generally speaking, um, when we're talking about a true stricture or stenosis in the central airways, more often than not, this is from benign etiology. Malignant etiologies cause narrowing of the airways all the time, but it's usually either through intrinsic mass, effect, mass lesion, extrinsic mass effect, or erosion through the airway wall. Um, but a true stricture or stenosis, generally, um, we're, we're thinking about benign diseases and, and we'll be focusing on benign diseases today. Um, another way to break things down is by characteristics. Um, and, and this comes uh, heavily into play in some of the topics Kevin will be covering, whether a lesion is simple versus complex. And, and Kevin's going to go into how we characterize that intrinsic versus extrinsic lesions, fixed or dynamic throughout the respiratory cycle. Um, and then lastly, and I think somewhere it's something that we think of when, when we're doing more distal bronchoscopic intervention is whether you have a unifocal lesion or multifocal lesions at, at various points throughout the airways. Grading systems and classification systems are also highly informative as are other ways of grading a patient by symptoms, by spirometry or by imaging features. Um, as, as we mentioned before, a lot of these diseases present in, in very similar ways. Often early on, people may have cough, nonspecific dyspnea, um, patients tend not to have dyspnea on exertion until they have much more significant degrees of tracheal stenosis or narrowing, usually less than eight millimeters. Somewhere between four to six millimeters is when people tend to start having symptoms at rest or strider or wheeze. Um, and then beyond that point, people can present with respiratory failure. Um, and it's always sort of impressive to see how, how well people look um, and how long they've tolerated a lesion um, that's so extreme in, in, in the degree of narrowing. Um, pictured on the right is a, is a cartoon of a classic fixed uh, obstruction with flattening of the inspiratory and expiratory limbs of the flow volume loop. And in reality, we don't, we don't tend to see this all that often, and, and we often don't see it until a lesion is very severe. Um, but this is sort of a nice example of, of that, uh, that uh, fixed obstruction flow volume loop in real life. And this was from a 35-year-old gentleman um, I, I took care of during pulmonary fellowship who was from Guatemala, had terrible nasal crusting, um, and had this very sort of junky looking uh, larynx and trachea um, that was biopsied and, and had um, Michelic cells and was ultimately diagnosed with uh, 
rhinoscleroma from Klebsiella yellow rhinoscleromatous infection. Um, so spirometry is something that we often we often get and we often look to when we're when we're evaluating patients with nonspecific respiratory symptoms or known central airways pathology. Um, but but unfortunately, spirometry can actually actually be quite normal um, with milder degrees of obstruction. Um, a lot of people have preserved FEV1 with tracheal diameters even as low as six to eight millimeters. Um, and there's some data suggesting that peak expiratory flow, which we tend to use a lot in our asthmatic patients, may actually be a more sensitive marker uh, for predicting the degree of narrowing. Um, in general, spirometry is a relatively poor indicator of the degree of stenosis, um, but can be quite good for looking at progression, looking at treatment, and looking at a treatment response. And this is often how we rely on spirometry in our practice. Um, imaging, I think we would all agree, is indispensable. And, and, and before you go in and start looking in someone's airway, it's really have a, it'd be nice to have a sense of what you're up against. Um, something that, that Kevin and I, I think, are very envious of in the ENT world is the ability to do um, flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy in clinic um, and, and, and be able to see what's going on. But, but oftentimes, before we you know, set the patient up to come in as an outpatient and get them into a procedure room, we, we really don't know what the airway is going to look like beyond what we see on a CT scan. Um, so dynamic CT is, is, has actually turned out to be a very good predictor of dynamic lesions, um, and static CT is very good overall, although with the understanding that it can both over or underestimate the degree of obstruction um, and, and does have a tendency to underestimate the extent or length of obstruction. Um, and, and this comes up when we're looking at lesions and thinking that maybe one or some interventions are appropriate, and we go in to find that it's similar in diameter for what we were expecting, but much more extensive in the airway. Um, so there's, you have to sort of take this with a grain of salt. Um, there are a lot of different formal grading and classification systems, and, and I think we, we really underutilize these. Um, as, as pulmonologists, we tend to use the Cotton-Meyer system, which is pictured here in the middle. But beyond that, we don't do a lot of formal grading of our lesions, but, but grading systems can be really helpful for a variety of reasons. Some are validated to predict successful decannulation. This is the, the McCaffrey grading system um, to objectively quantify the severity of stenosis. Um, to determine the likelihood of operative success um, or to facilitate uniformly detailed description. And, and this picture on the right is, is the uh, Freitag classification, which came out of the, the pulmonary and bronchoscopy literature um, and has nice inter-rater reliability, but I think is, is, is significantly underutilized. Um, but overall, really, uh, these systems are very helpful in improving communication between providers, um, plotting progress or progression of your interventions, and, and uh, in some instances, providing uh, metrics um, uh, for generating research. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think beyond looking at the etiology characteristics and grading, it's important to think about these diseases in the context of, of the patient overall. What prior interventions have they had? What are their comorbidities? What is their functional status like? And what are their goals of care? And, and this is something that we think about a lot when we're looking at a lesion that really could go in multiple directions. It could be managed operatively. It could be managed uh, bronchoscopically over serial uh, procedures. Um, and really getting an idea of, of, of the whole patient package and, and what their goals are is, is I think invaluable in the assessment. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll, we'll change gears a little bit and we'll, we'll go into some specific uh, etiologies. We'll talk about um, IP approach to specific uh, benign subglottic and tracheal conditions um, and some of the tools and techniques we use. And, and I, I thought these were sort of nice pictures to transition um, because they capture two very important aspects of, of interventional pulmonary. Um, one is that the rigid bronchoscope is, is a really great conduit for all these different tools. There's a laser fiber on the top over here. They've got rigid forceps going through suction catheter, really more tools going through at once than I think someone can, can manage or manipulate. Um, and then the picture on the right, um, I think is a, is a good reminder that it's important to not get so caught up in your interventions that you forget to connect the patient to the ventilator. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Uh, thanks, Brent. Um, so you know th this is a uh, this is a, an overview of some of the tools that we we use in the management of tracheal disease. Uh, most of these we're going to go over in much more detail when discussing the specific management uh, of different causes. But broadly, uh, they include mechanical uh, tools, and then hot and cold uh, ablation and debulking tools, uh, stents, of course, and then uh, medications uh, for both topical and injection. Um, so uh, next we'll begin it discussing, as Brian had mentioned, in a more of the specific management of common causes of tracheal stenosis. Uh, so I'll start with um, acquired, uh, specifically 
the post-intubation and post-tracheostomy stenosis. And then after that, I'll touch a base on idiopathic, primarily uh, idiopathic subglottic stenosis. And then lastly, Brian will uh, come back and talk about um, uh, systemic disease. Brian, if you could hit the arrows. There you go. And then, yeah. Uh, and then Brian will come back and talk about systemic diseases. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, outside of those three, it's, it's important not to forget that there are, of course, many, many causes of benign tracheal stenosis that weren't mentioning. Uh, I'm obviously not going to go through all of these, uh, but a few uh, include, in addition to the iatrogenic injury that we'll be going in, into much more detail, is, of course, external trauma uh, among infections. I think tuberculosis and histoplasmosis, is, uh, although we don't see these as often, they are our uh, primary culprits in the infection world. Under systemic disease, GPA, again, Brian will talk about, but also saw a fair amount of amyloid and sarcoid during my fellowship. And then, uh, and then another one I want to mention would be a form, form body aspiration, specifically pills. This is um, something that came up on, uh, often comes up in our boards and, and, and teaching topics, but Something I've yet to see would be specifically iron pill aspirations, uh, since they can quickly dissolve uh, form uh, free radicals, local inflammation, and then stenosis. Uh, so for post-intubation trachea uh, and post-tracheostomy stenosis, um, uh, it is the most common cause of benign trachea stenosis with a range of 10 to 22% of all intubated patients. Uh, although this does seem pretty high, a much smaller percentage actually develops severe enough symptoms. Um, so as Brian had mentioned earlier, the common teaching is, uh, you know, less than uh, symptoms that uh, with exertion usually occurs around eight millimeter trachea or 50% obstruction, where symptoms at rest occurs more around 70 to 80% obstruction or, or five millimeter uh, diameter. Among trache tracheostomy patients, the, the incidence is a little bit less at around 6%. And then in terms of onset, it's usually around uh, for post-intubation, it's at three to six weeks after intubation. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's a longer time interval with injury um, following post-tracheostomy. Yeah. Uh, so as I'm sure you're all aware, the most common cause of injury is due to uh, both high pressure cuffs uh, as, uh, as well as prolonged intubation. So uh, with high pressure cuffs, uh, the location of the tracheal damage often correlates with the site of the cuff. So as you can see in image A with an ET tube, uh, that would uh, be a site of injury. And then with image B, uh, with tracheostomies, there is the adibonus site of um, potential injury and stenosis at the stoma itself. And then even despite low cuff pressures or well-monitored cuff pressures, uh, just prolonged intubations and, and prolonged tracheostomy dependence themselves are a common cause. So how does injury occur? Uh, well, in both post-intubation and post-tracheostomy stenosis, um, the cuff pressure, whether it's really high or low over time, it will impede blood flow to the mucosa, uh, the local mucosa, and that leads to ischemic injury and necrosis. Uh, and in those who develop stenosis, it'll ultimately lead to a focal fibrotic scar. Uh, with, with tracheostomies, uh, since you have more prolonged cuff exposure, that, that the, uh, that can lead that often leads to granulation tissue formation, and then ultimately scar contracture of that granulation tissue. And then there's of course cartilage damage as well that certainly contributes. So how fast does this injury occur? Um, in the late 1960s, there was this uh, this publication um, of an autopsy study where they looked at patients who were either intubated or trached, and they had they had all died of non-respiratory causes but had their tracheas evaluated to kind of map out a timeline of injury based on how long they were intubated for. Um, this was, of course, a time when I imagine cuff pressures uh, were far, far, far higher and less likely monitored. Um, but as you can see here, days one to three, uh, things they noted were superficial tracheitis, uh, some fibrin deposition, and, and sh small shallow ulcers. And then during day three, uh, three to 10, uh, you get progression of these ulcers and then exposure of cartilage. Um, and as you can see here, there's this, just an image of uh, some of that cartilage exposure. And then as early as day 10, um, you get uh, fracturing and splitting of that cartilage, ultimately loss of cartilage, and, and then some places complete loss of tracheal structure, uh, as you can see in this image. So, so overall, it really doesn't take that much time to cause considerable damage. <clears throat> 
Uh, so one of the, what are uh, some of the more specific risk factors described in the literature? So two that we already mentioned were duration of intubation and, and high cut pressures uh, with intubation around 10 days and cut pressures more than 30 centimeters of water. Uh, other things to consider would be size of, ET, ET, of the ET tube during these prolonged intubations. Uh, and then of course, uh, multiple or traumatic intubations as well as difficult airways. Uh, and there's previously been reports of, you know, of trauma obviously with video, video laryngoscopes, um, a majority of which are in the oropharynx, so the palate, um, ritual pharyngeal injury as well as posterior glottic, but I've certainly seen um, a share of anterior subglottic injury just from advancing that rigid stylet too far. Uh, when it comes to post uh, tracheostomy specific ones, um, uh, later tracheostomy date, uh, and that's often in the setting of probably more due to prolonged intubation. Um, there are some studies that suggest larger initial tracheostomy size or even percutaneous compared to op open approaches uh, increase your risk. When it comes to patient-specific risk factors, obesity is probably the most significant one um, with diabetes and microvascular disease close behind. Uh, there, you know, I came across some studies uh, or cohorts of patients all who had tracheal stenosis and those who had diabetes uh, had a higher myocon grade, so um, even more of a severe stenosis in the setting of diabetes. There's some observational studies showing uh, patients who had keloids at higher incidence of, of developing tracheal stenosis. Um, and and I, you know, I did my fellowship in Detroit, and, and there are a fair number of keloid patients who I, I noticed this on before actually seeing it in the literature, which was interesting. And then um, severe reflux. Uh, history of radiation treatment, and then um, females as well. And I think female might have to do more with uh, in relation to ET tube size used. And then lastly, uh, these are far more hospitalization related, but things that affect poor tissue perfusion. So sepsis, organ failure, lead to hypotension, ischemic injury. Um, and then of course, active respiratory tract infections at the time of, uh, of their intubation or during their intubation. Uh, so when it comes to management, the, the gold standard really is surgical resection. Um, there are two larger retrospective studies looking at this. Both of them came out of MGH. Um, the first of the two uh, is from nine, uh, they looked at patients from 1965 to 1992. And they looked at a 521 patients who all underwent tracheal resection for um, post intubation or tracheostomy stenosis. And uh, they saw that just under 94% of their patients had good or satisfactory results. And, and this was essentially defined as anything that was a failure. <laughs> so um, anyone that did not require, require post-operative trach or T-tube. And the mortality in this uh, study was 2.4% from resection. And then the, the more recent of the two picked up right when the last one left off. So they looked from 93 to 2017 uh, 301 patients, again, 96% with good results with even lower mortality at 0.8%. So knowing this, uh, when should you consider bronchoscopic management? I, I think the most straightforward answer is, and the easiest answer is probably when they're non-surgical candidates. And this is often in the setting of patients who have uh, medical comorbidities where they wouldn't tolerate surgery. Uh, next, there are some features of the stenosis that may be better managed non-surgically. So for instance, long segments, uh, lengths greater than five centimeters or half the length of the trachea as this can kind of increase the risk for anastomotic dehiscence. And then uh, simple stenosis, as we'll talk about um, shortly here, can be managed non-surgically successfully. And then uh, high risk scenarios for failure with surgical resection. So um, if you go to the next slide, Brian, uh, what are some of these? The, so the, the second of the, or the more recent of those two MGH studies uh, actually looked at prognostic factors that, that um, contribute to poor surgical outcomes with tracheal resection in this population. So the only statistically significant one was tracheostomy at the time of surgery, as you can see there, uh, with 15% of the patients in this group failing. And then the other one to note uh, was calcified airway. So this was not statistically significant, but kind of trended in that direction. And, and they did note that this should be something that's considered uh, when, when talking resection, although my understanding there's, there's ways around it surgically to reduce the risk of, um, of, of failure in this group. Uh, other things I wanna mention that were notable on this table. So the average steroid dose um, in this study was only five milligrams. And at that dose, they didn't see any higher risk of failure, but 
uh, who knows higher doses may contribute. And then uh, lastly, uh, no surprise, but complications, patients who had complications had a higher risk of failing. And the most significant or most common complication was wound infection. So you see 23 patients there failed with complications and 15 of those 23 had an infection. All of them were associated with necrosis or anastomotic dehiscence. So that's, that's certainly something to consider when uh, patients with active infections are be, being considered for resection. Kevin, sorry to interrupt. Uh, do you know in that study what the criteria were for, the, for placing a tracheostomy at the time of surgery? That's a tracheostomy at the time of surgery, right? Not a previous tracheostomy. Right, right. No, it's a patient who had a tracheostomy at the time of surgery. But in terms of oh. um, why they, I assume they still had it. Be, uh, they, they didn't go into really detail about why they still had it. But it was just the fact that they had a trach at the time of surgery. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, the last time to consider was essentially as a bridge to surgical resection. Um, there you go. So uh, first patients who presented acute respiratory failure um, and a need immediate management essentially. So an overwhelming majority of the studies uh, or majority of the patients studied for surgical resection for tracheostenosis were outpatient. Um, so I think in that MGH study it was like 97% plus. So uh, you know patients who come in they're non optical uh, optical or optimal surgical candidates at the time. Um, bronchoscopic management it could be considered to help bridge them there. Uh, next, patients with respiratory tract infections, as we kind of just went through in the last slide. And then lastly, you know, patients who are on chronic high-dose steroids that could potentially impede wound healing and basically need time to safely wean them down could be considered uh, for bronchoscopic treatment. Um, so as Brian had mentioned, you know, characterizing the lesion really plays a, a key role in our management and plan. And, and that's really not just for post-intubation and post-tracheostomy stenosis, but really for all benign tracheal disease. So the, uh, in my opinion, probably the most important distinction that we make is whether the lesion is simple or complex. So on the left here, um, simple short segments uh, that are concentric cicatricial stenoses with intact cartilage and no malacia. Whereas on the right, you have a complex, uh, the complex stenoses are often longer, the eccentric, irregular, and they have uh, often damaged cartilage and malacia involved. So here are some examples of, of simple and complex stenoses. On the left uh, is subglottic, and the next to it is tracheal stenoses, whereas on the right, these are complex stenoses. You can, you can clearly see the, the cartilage is, is deformed on the image on the left for complex stenosis. On the right, you have uh, Malaysia. And then although this is really not done in practice, um, uh, some bronchoscopists, probably some of the older school bronchoscopists who uh, may, may have used some endobronchial ultrasound to really better characterize the substructure of the stenosis. So as you can see on the left, it's a simple stenosis. Um, uh, and then an ultrasound image where you can really see a pretty uniform circumferential hypertrophic scar with intact cartilage. And then on the right side, you have an ultrasound image of a complex lesion where you, you can see cal, you know, damage and calcifications of the tracheal ring. Uh, but you, again, you can usually see these grossly. Um, and then uh, here we'll dive a little bit more into the, the specific tools and techniques we use. So when it comes to endoscopic management, I know there's, there's a fair amount of familiar and similar tools used by ENT as well. Um, but the most common for simple stenosis for us involves radial incisions and balloon dilation. Uh, so uh, this is a mucosal sparing technique it, um, with the idea of basically preserving as much normal mucosa as possible, um, really minimizing for the airway trauma and you wanna allow for normal re-epithelialization of the airway rather than forming even more scar. Uh, so radial incisions, uh, we often use either laser or electrocautery. Um, you can hit the next, uh, you can hit the arrow, Brian. And it, uh, yep, so, uh, and then one more time. Okay, perfect. So uh, we use either laser or electrocautery here. You can see, obviously, we're using a, a laser tip. When it comes to laser, the, the two most common that we use are, are ND YAG or Homium. Um, you can see the cutting effect on it, not quite as good as a CO2 laser, but we, we use these lasers as well for tumor debulking and some 
for airway bleeds. Uh, so that most bronchoscopists are more comfortable with these because it, it allows us to use them really in both settings. Um, and then for both laser and electrocautery, as you know, the, the, the most significant limitation is severe hypoxia. So the FiO2 is gonna be less than 40% uh, to reduce the risk of airway fires. And then after uh, incisions, radio incisions, we do balloon dilations. Uh, so the balloons we have, they all, uh, the, the range in terms of outer diameter is quite broad. They go from four millimeters to 20 millimeters with balloon lengths of two to three centimeters. Uh, some of our larger balloons actually come from the GI world. Um, the balloon catheters can either go down our bronchoscope working channel or right next to it. And we often, for benign disease, dilate to about two, mi two minutes, as long as the patient can tolerate it since you're, you're, you're extracting the trachea. And then the other form of uh, mechanical dilation is with rigid, as you can see there on the right. Uh, the rigid barrels, uh, they, they also come in a wide range of diameters, anywhere from seven millimeter outer diameter to 13.2. Uh, our main workhorses are the, the 12 and the 13.2 millimeter barrels, but what we do is we essentially use the tip to, to, to this is usually after balloon dilation incisions, but uh, you gently stretch the tissue, advance the barrel past it, and then just leave it there for a few minutes to dilate. The, the benefit over the balloon in this setting, obviously, is that you have a you have an airway you can ventilate, and you can kind of leave the rigid barrel there as long as you want. And then for uh, topical agents, mitomycin C is is commonly used as a complement to uh, incision and drainage, and after both of those. Uh, so the way it works is it inhibits DNA synthesis, uh, fibroblast formation, and and um, it was actually initially used in ophthalmology uh, to prevent scarring and fibrosis after glaucoma procedures. Um, but with post-intubation and post-tracheostomy stenosis, there's data showing that can, it can help extend the time interval between endoscopic therapies. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, we, um, we basically just soak a, a tip of a Q-tip in, in mitomycin C, use a flexible forceps that go through our bronchoscope working channel, grab the Q-tip, and then and then apply it uh, circumferentially for about two minutes per application. And then uh, lastly, airway stenting. So uh, when do we consider it? So primarily in these two main settings. So one, frequent restenosis uh, following laser dilations in non-surgical candidates, and then in patients who have complex stenosis again in non-surgical candidates. Um, and I'll go, go through our stents in more detail in a, in, in a minute here, but uh, most of us will typically leave a, leave a stent in there for at least six months. Um, I'd say the shortest range is probably four months. And then the duration uh, sometimes is a bit longer in complex stenoses. Um, one, the one, one type of lesion where we, uh, we go, one type of complex lesion that usually goes directly to stenting is uh, the A-frame stenoses that can be seen in post-tracheostomy. As you can see on that uh, on the bottom of that image on the right. Uh, so again, this is this is due to a loss of your anterior support from the trachea rings due to cartilage damage, and you basically get this inward collapse of the lateral walls of your trachea. In these patients, balloon dilation doesn't work. There's really nothing to laser. Um, so if they're can surgical candidates, they should just go to surgery. If if they're not, then uh, we often go straight to stenting in them. Um, and the, what the stenting does is allows their airway to kind of remodel around that. Uh, when it comes to stents, we, we do have a decent variety of options. Um, I won't go into too much detail regarding the various indications for each because it can get quite granular. Uh, but the two main categories are silicone stents, you can see on the left, and, and bare metal stents on the right. The, the silicone stents, they come in either straight or, or Y stent formation, with the biggest benefit of the Y stents being essentially no risk of migration. Um, uh, because of the right and left uh, bronchial arms. They're all customizable. You can cut them to the length you need um, based on the patient's airways. Uh, the straight silicone stents do have a higher risk of migration, um, but they have a lower risk for granulation tissue, um, uh, but also build up more mucus. The, uh, the metal stents on the right, they come in a, a variety as well. So the top, they, they come in either completely covered, partially covered, or uncovered. Um, the, the benefit to the metal stents compared to silicone is they are generally easier to place and they're easier to remove. They, can, they don't need a rigid bronch to place, whereas the silicone stents need a rigid bronch. Um, these can be placed uh, sometimes straight through the flexible working channel uh, or through an ET tube. They're also usually easier to remove um, if they don't granulate too much. Uh, most 
most metal stents, uh, some of them have a hourglass formation, so the ends are a little bit wider, uh, that which makes uh, the risk of migration lower. Um, but again, the main downside to the, these is that they can uh, have a slightly higher risk for granulation, particularly the uncovered ones. And when it comes to tracheal stenosis, the most common ones we use are the uh, silicone or a fully covered metal. Um, so how do patients uh, do in, when they get bronchoscopic management alone? So this was published in 2016. This is a cohort of 126 patients, all considered non-surgical. Um, in this group, you can see that the majority of them were complex. Um, and the complex patients obviously required uh, far more bronchoscopies per patient compared to simple. Uh, but uh, out of the six who had simple, uh, who had simple stenoses, they had 100% they had response, um, whereas the complex had about 70% response with the 30% who failed needing repeat stent or surgical resection. And then you can see uh, the type of endoluminal treatments that were done amongst these patients were really a lot of what we really just talked about. Uh, so a lot of balloon dilation, lasers, um, mitomycin C, and then uh, stents. And then uh, this was another cohort included just so, because uh, uh, it had a few more, uh, more simple stenosis patients. Um, but here, 100, uh, similarly, 200 patients retrospective, all non-surgical candidates. 167 of which were simple stenoses versus 33 complex. And uh, the simple stenoses patients did um, pretty good from a bronchoscopic management standpoint with 96% response, uh, which is up there with surgical management. And then complex stenoses, not as great. Um, as you can see, 60, 69% uh, response, similar to, to the other study uh, with the others requiring, with the remaining 30% requiring either a repeat stent or a surgical resection. So. You know, overall, bronchoscopic management is, is I'd say, decent, um, good for simple stenoses, uh, not bad for complex. And then in terms of stent complications, just to kind of give you a broader view, this is a, a chest review article displaying stent complications among a number of different papers. Uh, so here they include both malignant and benign disease, as you can see. But uh, for the two benign disease in the uh, fourth and fifth column, uh, you can see granulation tissue is the most common issue. Uh, and, and this is probably, re this is the reason we often do not and really should not uh, stent proximal to the first tracheal ring. Because uh, then granulation tissue can form, develop into the cricoid space, and then you're essentially extending the injury further and further complicating any surgical resection if they are a, a candidate at some point. Um, other complications uh, to note, uh, mucus plugging. So they didn't report in the benign disease, but you can kind of get an idea from malignant. It's anywhere from seven to 24%. Sometimes this has to do more with the type of stent placed. Um, but really most, if not all, stent patients will naturally have more mucus production with the stent. And uh, for that reason, uh, a majority of us uh, will put patients uh, who have a stent on nebulized albuterol and hypertonic saline. Uh, twice a day, really just to manage these secretions as long as they have a stent in place. Uh, and then the last thing to point here is really stent migration. Um, they're really variable uh, here, five to 15% range, but the general teaching uh, amongst us is that the risk for stent migration is usually a little higher in, in benign disease. And again, it varies depending on the type of stent. And then, uh, so this is one management algorithm that I came across that seemed to to be consistent or at least close to, to, to management at, at, uh, um, at places I've trained. So here you have uh, the stenosis at the top. Um, if they have a simple stenosis on the left, uh, you undergo endoscopic treatment, that's laser and balloon dilation. In this algorithm, they try laser and balloon twice. If they recur, consider them for surgery. If they're non-surgical candidates, you try a few more times before you stent. Um, and then if they have complex stenoses, on the other hand, they go straight for a surgical evaluation. If they are non-operable, straight to stent. Uh, and if they are operable, they go to surgery. And in terms of how many times you really need a laser and, and balloon dilate before you decide to do a stent or surgery, there's, there's nothing I really came across um, in the literature to, to kind of give you an idea of that. <clears throat> 
And then lastly, I want to uh, touch briefly on uh, idiopathic subglottic stenosis. Um, so just a few slides on this. It, it's rare, uh, incidence of one in 400,000. It accounts for less than 5% of benign central airway tracheal stenoses. And an important thing uh, to, to consider is to rule out other potential etiologies, such as systemic diseases. Uh, demographically, it almost exclusively affects women, uh, often in their 30s and 40s when they present. And then their symptom onset is usually over months to years, and, and the pathogenesis really remains unclear. There's some question of whether estrogen related, but there's really no clear evidence to, to my knowledge to support that. Uh, and then there is some correlation of patients who have severe reflux. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, the characteristics of the lesion, so you know, idiopathic subglottic stenosis is really a clinical diagnosis. So after you take into account the patient demographics and ruling out other potential etiologies, these are the characteristics associated with the lesion. So um, most are uh, circumferential, um, cicatricial. They almost all, they usually involve the cricoid or, or near it, uh, certainly the first tracheal ring. And the average length is usually about one to three centimeters. And the, and the management is really similar to what we just went through for post-intubation and post-tracheostomy with, with the main goal is the idea is characterizing the lesion as being key to then formulating a treatment plan. Um, the gold standard, again, is surgical resection in these, in these patients with similar considerations for bronchoscopic management, uh, with uh, an additional caveat being that less dense are usually placed in these patients due to the cricoid or, or um, uh, cricoid involvement and risk for granulation tissue formation. So those who do undergo bronchoscopic management, how do they do? Uh, similarly, if for short lesions uh, in intact cartilage, so simple stenoses, they do okay. Uh, for, for longer stenoses, probably not so great compared to post-intubation and post-tracheostomy. And, and the recurrence rates in these scenarios uh, seem to be a bit higher compared to um, um, uh, post-intubation, post-tracheostomy with recurrence up to 80%, uh, 87% in five years. So, so we'll... Um... Uh, we'll, we'll switch gears uh, in, in, in our time remaining and talk about some, uh, some non-acquired um, systemic conditions that can cause tracheal and subglottic um, and, and, and sometimes more diffuse distal airway stenosis. Um, and and we, we were thinking about other, other things to talk about and whether to talk about infection or, or autoimmune disease. And we felt that autoimmune disease would, would be sort of a nice way to, to end, um, specifically talking about GPA and relapsing polychondritis, because I think they they sort of present uh, different management challenges and, and we tend to approach them in, in different, uh, different uh, manners. Um, so uh, the most common, uh, probably most common autoimmune disease that we see causing tracheal and subglottic stenosis is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So it's an ANCA associated vasculitis, small vessel leukocytoclastic vasculitis with airway necrosis. Um, affects about four and a half to 18 uh, per 100,000 persons uh, in the US and Europe where it tends to be more common. Um, of patients with GPA, the vast majority of them have sinonasal symptoms, um, and up to over half um, will have some tracheobronchial involvement, and this includes about a quarter with subglottic stenosis. Uh, median age is around 50. Uh, men and women seem to be affected relatively uh, at relatively similar rates, although women present with a higher incidence of, of uh, subglottic stenosis. Um, and there's a classic triad of necrotizing granulomatous inflammation in the respiratory tract, necrotizing vasculitis and autoimmune glomerulonephritis, but really the disease can affect virtually any tissue or organ system. Um, this, these pictures sort of give you an idea of the, of the sort of diffuse and protean nature of the disease in its uh, airway and respiratory manifestations um, from uh, sort of moving from top left to bottom right. There's subglottic stenosis, tracheal stenosis, lobar and segmental stenoses, um, necrotizing casts and pseudomembranes, um, pyogenic bronchitis, uh, inflammatory pseudotumors in the lungs, and then lastly, capillaritis um, with uh, dreaded diffuse, al diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Um, patients who have airway involvement from GPA um, often have a delayed diagnosis in the absence of other systemic manifestations. This is partially because they may have a nonspecific presentation, but also because about a fifth of those, these patients are ANCA negative, um, and biopsy of the airway lesions is unhelpful in about 75%. Um, and then furthermore, in patients who have a, ultimately receive an appropriate diagnosis, um, their airway disease may develop or progress despite successful systemic treatment of their other extra respiratory symptoms. Um, and systemic therapies are often insufficient to control their airway manifestations in up to about a half.
Um, so how do systemic and endoscopic therapies compare? Um, there is, are some data to suggest that endoscopic therapies may be more efficacious um, for the airway manifestations of GPA. Um, and, and especially that patients who have um, uh, isolated airway disease uh, may be able to either avoid or discontinue systemic therapies with appropriate endoscopic interventions. So what are, uh, and um, I think the, the one caveat to this is, is um, was from a, a study of, of about 47 patients uh, published in 2015, um, where they looked at giving systemic prednisone around the time of endoscopic intervention. And it seems that of all the other systemic uh, treatment modalities, um, steroids around the time of, of, of your, your uh, uh, airway intervention, um, uh, both significantly increases the amount of time between individual procedures um, and increases the likelihood that your procedure will be efficacious and durable. Um, with, a, with a very significant hazard ratio. So it's sort of become more standard of, of practice to um, uh, give systemic steroids um, around the time of endoscopic intervention. Uh, so what are the data for uh, endoscopic treatments in GPA? So this is a relatively earlier study uh, looking at, at patients who underwent airway procedures. Um, this is from Carol Langford um, uh, at the NIH uh, at the time. Um, and she looked at uh, 20 patients out of a cohort of 43 um, patients with GPA and subglottic stenosis, um, half of whom were on systemic therapy and 10 of whom had already uh, required a tracheostomy to help deal with their, their respiratory disease. Um, 20 underwent endoscopic therapy and, and she noted that um, patients required a median of three interventions per uh, uh, interventions overall. Um, there was increasing stability between interventions over time. So within the first six months of the study, of, of, of the retrospective study, patients required um, significantly more frequent interventions than they did six months later. Um, and that of the patients who had tracheostomies, six were decannulated with, with successful endoscopic therapies um, and no patients required uh, a new tracheostomy. Um, another study uh, published sometime later um, in JAMA looking at 44 patients with GPA airway involvement. The majority of them had subglottic stenosis plus or minus some other tracheal or bronchial uh, involvement um, and of, of, of which 39 underwent endoscopic treatment. Um, again, a relatively low number of median interventions per patient. 97% um, achieved, uh, ultimately achieved um, a, a st symptomatic stability uh, exceeding 12 months between treatments. Um, and what they saw was that in their patients who were treated before 2007, 13 required tra tracheostomy, although um, just under half were, were decannulated with endoscopic intervention. Um, and from 2007 onward, they had uh, some changes in their, in their management style for um, uh, for tracheal uh, uh, GPA-related airway disease. Um, and from 2007 onward, only one patient required a tracheostomy, and this was for a period of around three weeks before they were successfully decannulated. Um, and although they don't, go in, they don't go into the details of what the changes in management are, um, there were some publications around that time that sort of changed how we approach um, autoimmune airway disease and GPA in particular. Um, and, and this sort of leads us into talking about what our most, our most effective endoscopic therapies are and, and, and what our standard of practice is. Um, so, so the most effective treatments that, that, that have, have the most literature to support them for GPA are use of radial incisions, balloon dilations combined with the application of, of steroids. And this is usually uh, methylprednisolone injected into the lesion. Um, and the thought is that combining these three both serves to alleviate the obstruction um, as well as to decrease inflammation or reduce future inflammation in the lesion. Um, and and there's, there's some data to support uh, this regimen. Uh, so this was, was one of the earlier publications that looked specifically at these three modalities put together. This is from Thorax uh, in 2008. Um, they took 18 patients with GPA, 13 of whom had tracheal disease, five of whom had more diffuse tracheal bronchial disease who underwent either laser or electrocautery cuts, uh, balloon or rigid dilation and steroid injections. Um, patients needed a, a, a range of one to four procedures, um, but the mean intervention uh, fear, uh, intervention free period um, was significantly longer than in previous studies, up to 26 months. Um, and, and notably, no patients in this cohort required a tracheostomy, and there were no patients that ultimately needed surgical intervention. Um, and, and they also noted that patients who had isolated tracheal disease um, did uh, just as well to patients who had uh, diffuse tracheal bronchial manifestations, suggesting that these interventions were, were both efficacious in the central airways as well as more distally. Um, another study that, that sort of supported this, um, this intervention, uh, 21 patients with GPA and, and specifically subglottic stenosis treated with laser cuts, dilations, and steroid injections. Um, no patients, again, required tracheostomy or surgical intervention. 
Um, and they saw that for patients with non-scarring lesions, more acute inflammatory uh, uh, stenoses um, only required a mean 2.4 procedures um, and, and had an amine uh, nearly 12 months between their endoscopic inter uh, interventions. Um, in contrast, they looked at patients who had more chronic fibrotic scarring lesions, and they saw that these patients actually did uh, slightly less well. They required more procedures over the, the, uh, the period of follow-up, um, and they tended to uh, last uh, less long before requiring, requiring another intervention. Um, and so results like these have sort of um, led people to ask whether mitomycin C, which Kevin talked about as, a, as, a, as an efficacious uh, uh, treatment for some uh, more chronic fibrotic uh, stenoses, might also be effective in GPA. Um, so there's, there's a lot of studies looking at mitomycin being effective. One study suggesting actually superior efficacy to steroids in non-autoimmune stenosis, um, and, and as well as some small studies in case series suggesting that it might be similarly effective in GPA. Um, and, and, and one of the running thoughts, um, and this would support what we saw in the previous study, is that mitomycin C might actually be more efficacious in patients with more mature fibrotic scarred lesions rather than those more acute inflammatory lesions where steroids seem to be most, uh, most effective. Um, another modality that, that um, has, has sort of uh, slowly kind of crept into practice is cryospray. So cryospray is, is really just liquid nitrogen condensed and then expelled through a, a, a bronchoscopic catheter um, that uh, gets down to a temperature of, a, of minus 196 degrees Celsius. Um, it can cause a diffuse tissue injury um, with necrosis down to the cartilaginous level. Um, and the thought is that by causing that a tissue injury and having tissue sloughing, you can have some remodeling um, over time and, and with the hope that uh, when, when the uh, mucosa reproliferates, um, it does so in a, in a, in a more normal fashion. Um, and people are looking into cryospray now for a variety of other benign conditions, including um, other uh, acquired um, or injurious uh, uh, tracheobronchial strictures and stenoses, as well as uh, chronic bronchitis. Um, so this was, was a study uh, from 2016, 26 individuals with uh, tracheobronchial stenosis, 13 of whom had GPA, who were treated with cryospray and balloon dilation. Um, patients underwent a mean 1.8 procedures, um, and they saw that uh, all patients had significant symptomatic improvement over a, a median 11-month follow-up period, um, and there was a significant reduction in the severity of stenosis. So at the start of the, of, of the, of the study, 88% of individuals had Cottenmeyer grade 3 to 4 lesion, um, and after intervention, this was down to 15%. Um, but, but beyond this, what they noted was that patients who had GPA actually had a significantly fewer number of procedures required to achieve a durable uh, symptomatic improvement. Um, and, and although we don't have access to cryospray in our department, we're sort of, I think, always, always interested in, 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 in using it and, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity at some point in the future. Um, uh, lastly, um, uh, what, are the, what are the indications or, or potential benefits of stenting in GPA? Um, so in contrast to some of the conditions that Kevin talked about, there's really very limited data with mixed outcomes for stenting in GPA. Um, and a lot of us really worry about the risks of granulation, restenosis, erosion, and perforation. Um, this is a picture on the right of, of um, a, a wall stent, which was a, an uncovered uh, woven uh, um, nitinol stent that Boston Scientific used to make. Um, that, that were thought to be really great because you place them, they alleviated the obstruction, they re-epithelialized, and that seemed really attractive. Um, but that re-epithelialization kind of kept going and going and going until someone had a new, worse, longer stenosis. Um, and then these stents um, became a, a real uh, nightmare to remove. Um, so uh, stenting in GPA is anecdotally safer in scarred lesions. Um, where you have sort of a more burnt out disease and a more chronic fibrotic lesion um, with less inflammation that might promote granulation and, and, and uh, potentially erosion and perforation. Um, and our general approach is to very, very, very cautiously use silicone prostheses with very close surveillance. Um, in in my, uh, my interventional training, I think really the only situations where we would use any kind of airway prosthesis in GPA were patients who had very, otherwise very well controlled disease very chronic upper airway scarred lesion and a trach. And we were really trying to use a T-tube to help recanalize the upper airway with the hope of decannulating them one day or at least having them be able to phonate um, with their trach in place. Uh, uh, lastly, what, um, what are the indications for surgery uh, and surgical management in GPA? And, and, and unlike uh, some of the topics Kevin talked about, there's not a lot of great data to support resection um, at least that I could find in, in GPA. So a few different studies, all very small cohorts again, 
Um, eight patients with GPA who underwent resection, 75% of whom required subsequent endoscopic interventions, and this included one trach. Um, 15 patients with GPA, 100% of whom required subsequent intervention after resection. Um, and this was in contrast in the same study to 24 patients with idiopathic subglottic stenosis who did exceptionally well after surgical resection and required no further intervention. Um, and then lastly, 11 patients with GPA, a little over a half required subsequent intervention, um, including one tracheostomy. Um, so, so what is our overall approach to GPA? Um, in all patients, we really consider endoscopic intervention if they're symptomatic, um, regardless of their systemic therapies and regardless of whether the rest of their disease process is well controlled. Um, and in general, we consider prednisone at around the time of intervention because of that data suggesting that it may improve the durability and the success of your intervention. Uh, for patients with acute or subacute stenosis, um, we generally prefer incisions, whether laser or cautery, dilations and steroid injections in combination over any one intervention alone. Um, and, and I think if available, one might consider cryospray, although, although uh, I, think, I think we'll probably be getting more data on this in the near future. Um, and in chronic lesions, um, considering switching out uh, your steroids for either topical or injected mitomycin C based on the fact that it, it, it may be more appropriate for uh, addressing the underlying pathology and chronic scarring fibrotic lesions. Um, and again, to very, very cautiously um, consider silicone stenting after, after a really thorough review of um, other interventions that have been tried um, and, and real good discussions with the patient about the potential risks associated with stenting in, uh, in uh, autoimmune um, airway disease. Um, so to wrap up, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll spend a, probably about three minutes talking about relapsing polychondritis, um, which presents sort of a nice contrast to GPA and, and, and we'll, we'll see why. Um, so RP is another autoimmune infl inflammatory condition affecting the cartilage and scleral structures. Um, there are no specific autoantibodies for, for RP, but up to 30% of people will have some autoantibody against a collagen subtype, and this is usually collagen subtype two. Um, incidence is lower than GPA, about three and a half per 1 million persons. Affects people in a similar age range, 40s to 50s. Um, women may be slightly more affected than men in terms of airway involvement. Um, and somewhere between 20 and 50% of patients with RP will have airway disease at some point um, in their course of disease. Um, and as we saw in GPA, diagnosis can be delayed in the absence of other um, extra pulmonary features and, and, and most notably in the absence of auricular involvement. Um, there are a lot of different ways that RP, RP can present in the airways. It's a little more restricted in its presentation than GPA. Um, about 45% of people with airway disease have some form of, of laryngotracheal chondritis. Um, over time, this inflammation and, and damage to the trachea can lead to, uh, to the cartilage can lead to uh, long lasting uh, degradation, of the cartilage structures leading to malacia. Patients can also have um, focal uh, scarring or stricturing from chronic inflammation leading to stenosis. Uh, and over here on the right is a, um, a coronal CT scan showing a multi-level stenosis in a patient with RP, sort of a high thoracic inlet stenosis, and then another tighter stenosis at the left main stem bronchus takeoff. Um, so in contrast to GPA, um, airway disease and RP often responds quite nicely to systemic therapy, with the exception of more chronic lesions or, or airway malacia where the damage is often irreversible. Um, and in contrast to GPA, instrumentation can actually provoke or worsen a flare-up. Um, and it's, it's not entirely uncommon for patients to have increased airway edema, spasm, or inflammation uh, secondary to a bronchoscopic intervention, even if it's just an airway inspection with gentle dilations. Um, and, and then furthermore, unlike what we saw in GPA, um, endoscopic interventions may really not obviate the need for intubation or a surgical airway. And in patients who are tenuous, they may actually tip them over the edge. Um, so, so by and large, uh, we reserve our endoscopic interventions for patients who really have severe life-threatening airway manifestations, um, patients that can't be weaned from mechanical ventilation, patients who absolutely want to avoid uh, being intubated or having a tracheostomy and they're willing to accept some of those risks of treatment, um, or patients with chronic airway disease, for example, patients with burnt out systemic or well-controlled systemic disease, but chronic malacia or chronic stenosis. Um, the last few slides uh, just go over some data for stenting and relapsing polychondritis. So it used to be more common to stent these patients um, and there's very, very limited data on, on stent efficacy. Um, one study looked at patients who had severe um, uh, uh, acute disease, three of whom were on mechanical ventilation and two were sort of towing the, 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 the mechanical uh, ventilation line. Um, and uh, these patients underwent placement of, of metallic stents in the airway. 41% of the stents were placed in the trachea. 
um, two patients were successfully weaned from mechanical ventilation and, and survived for a not unreasonable period of time after their intervention, and, and two were able to avoid mechanical ventilation. Unfortunately, one died despite intervention. Um, another study looking at, at stenting for, for more chronic airway pathology in, in relapsed in polychondritis, 27 patients who underwent stent placement, about a third were placed in the trachea. Um, and again, they showed that in these individuals with more chronic disease, there was significant improvement in spirometry, significant improvement in exercise tolerance and, and overall functional status. And this improvement was sustained for a median follow-up of about 50 months. Um, unfortunately, there was a rel relatively high uh, incidence of adverse events. Um, although these were mostly minor, a little bit of granulation, mucus plugging, chronic cough, um, and unrequired stent removals. Um, so, so our approach to RP really, in contrast to GPA, is to optimize systemic th therapies before anything else. If a patient can be spared an endoscopic intervention, we generally choose to, to go in that direction. Um, patients with acute, severe, or life-threatening symptoms, um, often it's helpful to add prednisone on top of their systemic therapy, escalate their systemic immunosuppression, um, and to really consider intervention very cautiously in patients in whom mechanical ventilation or a surgical airway is inadequate, patients who cannot be weaned from mechanical ventilation, or patients who are really pursuing, pursuing last resort or end-of-life care. Um, and then lastly, in patients with really chronic persistent symptoms, for example, from burnt out systemic disease and a chronic fibrotic stenosis or malacia, um, these are the individuals in which we would consider endoscopic interventions and possible stenting. Um, but in general, in contrast to GPA, RP is a disease that we, we really try to avoid uh, doing inter airway interventions as much as possible um, for fear of making the disease process worse. Um, so, so with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. We have sort of two, two little summary slides and, 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 uh, you know, when Kevin and I were meeting and talking about this, we were sort of, um, trying to, trying to figure out our, our niche in the, in, in, in the center of, of our ENT and thoracic surgery colleagues, um, as we all sort of manage different diseases between the larynx and the diaphragm. Um, and, and, and I think in the end, you know, looking at the literature and looking at, at our interventions and in, in contrast to what other, other, uh, uh, other folks do, um, I think it's less that that IP offers something drastically different, but more that we sort of offer complementary approaches to shared problems. Um, we have slightly different perspectives, we have different training, and I think that um, there really isn't a one size fits all intervention for for the problems that we that we deal with every day. Um, and I think some situations where where bronchoscopic approaches uh, can be considered and may be efficacious are, are patients with multi level or lower tracheal disease or or disease that extends distally into the bronchi. Um, patients like Kevin talked about with lesions that are not amenable to surgery or conditions uh, like certain autoimmune conditions where surgery, uh, surgical management um, might not offer liberation from further endoscopic intervention. Um, patients who are poor surgical candidates or patients who are unwilling to undergo surgery um, or as a potential bridge to surgical management. And of course, in patients um, as a last alternative to surgical intervention or in patients who are seeking more palliative or, or end of life, um, end of life uh, interventions. Um, and with that, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. And, and again, we thank you so much for having us here um, and for your time and opportunity to talk to you and we'll take any questions. So there's one question um, and thank you so much for, uh, for the great lecture. Um, do you, the question is, do you ever use OCT to evaluate airway stenosis? N no, um, but uh, um, we, uh, when I was, when I was a, a pulmonary fellow here, we were really interested in, in, in using it in the airways and, and, and um, seeing if there was a way to apply it. Um, there's a group out in uh, either at NGH or Brigham that uh, does a lot of OCT airway work. And they started off looking at OCT for um, fibrotic lung disease and trying to char uh, characterize and classify different interstitial lung diseases. Um, and then they started to do some airway work in transplant patients. Um, and so uh, Hermit Beatty, um, uh, one of the other IP docs and, 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 and Kevin and I were interested in looking at this and seeing if we could kind of port that over to what we do and, and use that for some of our lung transplant airway complications to see um, uh, whether we could identify any abnormalities using OCT. Unfortunately, um, it's, it's not a technology that we have access to currently um, and, and, and that isn't um, uh, 
uh, isn't available to us, but it's something that we were very actively interested in pursuing and trying to see if there was a way we could like collaborate with them and, and get that technology over. Um, I think it would be fascinating to, to do that. Um, and there are some groups doing, doing it now, but, but I think it's still pretty early on, but, but definitely a, um, a really interesting technology. Thank you. Brian and Kevin, it's Kwong Sung. I'm one, one of the laryngologists. Uh, thank you for uh, coming over and uh, doing this talk with us. Uh, it's nice to work with you guys. I've had a lot of collaborations with Arthur and uh, Harmeet uh, over the years, uh, shared some patients. Usually it's the tougher ones that I'm, I'm calling them for. Uh, but you know, it's interesting looking at your perspective also. you know, We share definitely some commonalities and probably some differences. Uh, as well. Uh, we probably, uh, I, I've i been doing uh, a lot of, mo most everything endoscopically in the last few years. I've done very few uh, open procedures since um, uh, starting to uh, treat lesions uh, with uh, intralesional steroid injections on a, on a kind of a serial basis. I've been able to uh, deal, do a lot of uh, manage a lot of things that normally might have gone to an open procedure. Um, I've also uh, been more aggressive with my laser use using OmniGuide CO2 laser. Um, I, I, I've found that it, uh, I think it cuts a lot, lot faster than uh, the, the YAG laser or the Homium laser. It's just uh, able to, to do a lot more and I, I can uh, even in things like A-frame deformities, I can shave down a uh, few millimeters of cartilage and, you know, in a pretty narrow stenosis, gaining just a few millimeters can be, uh, can make a big difference because, you know, as we know, resistance is uh, to the inverse fourth power of, of, of radius of the, of the airway. So, you know, when, a, with a small airway, just doing a couple of millimeters of shave on a on a on a um, on the cartilage can can make the difference between not needing a, a, a larger intervention. Um, but uh, those are kind of some of the things that I've that I found helpful. And I think in general ENTs have gotten away uh, from doing mitomycin. Um, we just haven't found it to be that that uh, that helpful. Um, uh, just, I think, kind of the mechanism of action, just uh, because it, you're uh, suppressing fibroblasts, and fibroblasts don't really uh, enter into the equation until about seven days after, you know, after the intervention, and by that time, the mitomycin is really probably gone, so I've seen it cause uh, a lot of granulation or fibrinous debris and cause airway obstruction when we've used it aggressively. So I've pretty much stopped using mitomycin these days. Uh, but uh, it's so interesting. You know, the cryotherapy is something that certainly there's there's uh, maybe not enough uh, not enough um, data on still. I've seen. Some people have done well, and I've seen some disasters with with the cryotherapy. Like they've done it, and it's come. The stenosis has just come back uh, with a vengeance, uh, you know, uh, after after it after the cryotherapy. Yeah, one one of the things that that has sort of I think challenged bronchoscopists or made us worried about using cryospray more distally is. Um, that with the earlier systems, there wasn't the, the same pressure regulation or pressure pop off. And so you generate these really high pressures. And if you were more distal, you could cause pneumothorax. And so um, that I think gave a lot of people pause in, in using it in more distal uh, airway lesions. And, and um, hopefully that's, it sounds like that's improved. Um, I haven't had any experience with it, but I'm, I'm interested to see some of those sort of different responses that people have is interesting. Kevin, did you did you use a lot of mitomycin? Uh, we did. Um, I'll be honest. When I went in to look for the literature on it, I was actually surprised to find anything to support it. Um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of when we when we used it in training, it was kind of like uh, the person who trained the person who trained the person all used it, and it's kind of passed down. and <laughs> And I always knew that the, the literature supporting was was not very strong. And then, uh, to be honest, only the only the, the the one paper I saw that was supporting was was I think out of laryngoscopy, but 
but yeah, I, it's it's not good. It's not good support. Uh, um, it's a bit of a nuisance to do, to be honest. Yeah. There was a there was a recent publication for stenosis, benign stenosis in transplant patients, where they injected it, and they had they had success. But and I I've I, I've done that recently, but I I didn't notice that it my for my end of one, I didn't notice it did anything, and I, I had a similar experience to you, Kevin, with with mitomycin. You know. No. All right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.